Today we celebrate the memorial of St. John of the Cross. And I mentioned in Mass, the quote of his that is maybe less famous, but he, he once said that the first language of God is silence. And he also added to that later beautifully, in the eternal silence, God spoke only one word. And that word was Jesus. So in this Christmas season, we are asked to meditate on that one word that God spoke. Uh, the eternal word of Jesus. And as we reflect on the word of God, we ask the graces we need to invite that <coughs> eternal word to dwell in our hearts this season. We pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you missed our last gathering a couple weeks ago, I will not go back through it uh, because it's not very loaded with theological concepts. I would just go as far as say is there's a healthy debate whether Galatians or Thessalonians is the oldest, but I don't care on some level. We're doing the two oldest first, so I'll let you choose which you think is oldest, but you know, with Galatians, we dealt with the first problem of the church, how to how to pastorally care for Gentile converts to Christianity, whether they had passed through Judaism or if they could go directly to Christianity, and the determination was they could directly become Christians. That is a separate, a new covenant with new guidelines. Um, an ancient problem, anyway. And this letter, these letters deal with another ancient problem, the second coming. Many times Jesus spoke of it, uh, but it's obviously the expectation of the people that this will happen pretty soon. And what to do about that, how to carry yourself in, in the light of that. Um, that's what we're going to get to today. We just barely touched on it at the end of last time. Um, with this first Thessalonian letters, five chapters, we, were, we had just finished <laughs> chapter three. Um, Anyway, I want to touch on one little point before we finish. The main, stylistically, the main thing you notice from it is it's very encouraging. It's very gentle because the people of Thessalonica were being persecuted. We don't know exactly by who or why, but he, he repeatedly mentions it in both letters. So I think his thought is, um, I, I said it in the evening class, you may have heard this uh, quote that's often given to preachers. Uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Have you ever heard that? I think if you look at Thessalonians and Galatians side by side and realize it's the same human author, it's a perfect example of that. The Galatians were comfortable, they thought they were righteous, so he afflicted them. <laughs> and the, the Thessalonians are suffering under persecution, uh, they're afflicted, so he comforts them. And his, his style can accommodate for the situation. The one thing that we, we touched on last time was the passage that, um, actually, did, did we end on chapter 3 or did we end on part way through chapter 4? What is your recollection of the verse we ended on? Resounding. Who knows?
transgressed and wronged his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we saw before warning him. For God has not called us for uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. But concerning the love of the brethren, you have no need to have anyone write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, and indeed, you do love all the brethren throughout Macedonia. But we exhort you, brethren, to do so more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we charged you, so that you may command the respect of outsiders and be dependent on nobody. A couple of things. There's nothing of major significance in this, but it's kind of subtle and light at first, that you mind your own affairs and work with your hands. It's a beginning touch on avoiding idleness, because the one one of the afflictions of this community, they're, they receive the gospel, and he compliments them, a rare thing for St. Paul, uh, because they're an evangelizing community. They not only took on this this understanding of love, but they spread the message throughout all of Macedonia themselves, without Paul's help, and they were successful at it. So he, he comments from Corinth, my goodness, I was only with you three weeks, and now all, all of Macedonia has heard of Christianity. Two guys are amazing. Uh, but this hint of idleness, because some people apparently just have this idea that if the second coming is happening, then I don't need to go to work. This is not the case because they don't know exactly when it's coming. This is what he wants to touch on. But he, he gets more and more specific about it by the second letter. You hear the term busy bodies. Many of you are acting like busy bodies, but you're not being busy. If you ever wondered the origin of the word busy body, it's from St. Paul. It's actually the Bible. Um, but from verse 13 is where it's significant. So it says, in regards to the coming of the Lord. But we would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of trumpets of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, I think that the point that St. Paul's trying to make is some people perhaps are concerned. What if we already died and we missed the second coming? Are we at some kind of disadvantage? Do you have to be living to enjoy the fruits of his second coming? And he, he says there's an order to this. The deceased shall be raised up first and then Clearly, some of you will be alive when the second coming happens, um, and they'll be taken up. But this passage is the origin of, this along with one other, is the origin of the belief in something called the rapture, which is not a Catholic teaching, just so you know. Uh, the other passage that goes with it is one we heard a few weeks ago, or maybe last week, I think it's tracking my mind. You can help me. Uh, when it says, two men will be working in the field, and one will be taken, and one will be left behind. And two women will be at the loom, and one will be taken, and one will be left behind. Was that last week? No, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Yeah. Two weeks ago, okay. Yeah, it's from Matthew. We're in the year of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel has moments of what we call apocalyptic style of writing. Kind of shifts in and out. This is one image. And it inspired a book series called Left Behind. Yeah. Right from the 1980s. Uh, it was a best-selling series in the evangelical world, and it inspired a TV miniseries after the same name. This idea that, the, and generally the idea of the rapture, as it is classically taught, is that the second coming of 
Christ will be a wrathful one, but God will spare the good people by beating them up ahead of time so they don't have to suffer and only the crummy people will have to suffer. It is an attractive message because it seems to imply if I just mind my mind the rules and try to be a good person, I don't I don't have to suffer all these territory. This is what I want to say about that. A quick Wikipedia reference, but I, I spend a moment to do this because this is not a majority view in Protestant Christianity. It's not, not a majority of Christians believe in this. However, a majority of fundamentalist Christians do believe in it. And it describes our neighborhood here in Southern Oregon. There are a lot of fundamentalist Christians. This is something that is taught. A quick I don't necessarily hold up Wikipedia as the, <laughs> the all-encompassing authoritative thing, but I pointed out just, it took me that 30 seconds to pull this up. The comment in there said, as the Catholic Church holds, this is not a historical teaching. It is a recent teaching. In fact, uh, one source credits the beginnings of this teaching to the year 1833 to a man named John Nelson Darby, of British descent who wrote his own translation of the Bible. His belief in taking these two passages quite literally, um, that people would be taken up in the air and then the wrath of God would come. So the way he taught it was that the rapture would first take place, the good people take it from the earth. And the idea amongst people is the only hope you have left is there will be Bibles. And if you can find one, and if you can change your view and stop being an unbeliever, maybe you have a chance to be saved, but you know, kind of the, part of the, I think, the idea of kind of Gideon's Bible is putting them in every hotel room and stuff, and getting the printed word out. Um, and then this rapture will be followed by seven years of wrath, and then a thousand years, a millennium of uh, messianic age. That's not a belief, okay? So, all you need to know, loosely, just remember as you encounter this, it's an idea invented in the 1800s. It ha it's completely separated from apostolic tradition. Uh, but it's what can happen if you if you are a sola scriptura, if you say you're scripture only, and also if you're a fundamentalist. A fundamentalist, if you're not familiar with the term, is someone who reads every line of scripture literally. Uh, it goes against the first rule of scripture study that I've shared with you, that for us, the word Bible, and literally the, the word Bible means library. It's not a book, it's a, a collection of books, each book being written in its own unique style, each book written by a unique human author, but also in common with a uh, consistent author, the Holy Spirit throughout. The Holy Spirit inspired works to be taught without treading on the free will of the human author. Uh, everything the Holy Spirit wanted to say in the Bible, he did. Um, but to understand properly each book of the Bible, we take a look at the style it's written in. For instance, we just heard a little bit of apocalyptic literature. How do I understand that? Um, a fundamentalist does not make that distinction. They read every book in the exact same way. Uh, and if you do that, and if you also violate the second rule, which is for us, as Catholics, we read the Bible holistically, all the books together. If there's if there's an apparent contradiction, we would say the problem is with our mind, with our lack of understanding, not with the books. And we wouldn't we wouldn't agree with Martin Luther that one book outranks other books when there's a conflict. They have to stand in balance with each other, um, and from that we get the truth. And if we're not certain, we turn to the magisterium of the church, who tells us. Uh, does that make sense to people? Okay. Anyway, so the rapture, not a belief of ours. Um, however, there are two points that I do want to make that, that are brought up with it um, sort of from the same source, Sola Scriptura and fundamentalist reading, like taking a line of scripture and reading it by itself, how to make sense of it. And these two things pertain to the end of the world. Uh, they're probably common questions that come up, so I'd just like to take a minute at least to make you aware of the Catholic position on it. The first one comes from Matthew, which is the Gospel we're in this year. If you have your Bible, just turn to Matthew chapter 24.
there's, so, there's one other thing you can take for this. At least if you're in my neighborhood, probably at least once a month you get little doorknob hangers. <laughs> and then it announces there's a conference coming up about the end of the world and how we know we're close. Um, it basic, basically built around the idea of something we sometimes refer to as Bible code or a fundamentalist. If you don't, re if you don't recognize and acknowledge that apocalyptic literature is its own different style with symbolism and strange images, um, the tendency is to say, oh, I know what the seven-headed beast is. That's Russia. I know what this event is. That's the... The murder is happening in Chicago. I know what this is. That's the Ukraine war. No. It's, apocalyptic literature is, is not to be understood in that way. Um, so, but I would, my advice would be any Christian who claims to know the end of the world, run the other way. <laughs> this would be a really good sign not to associate with people like that. It's, it sells tickets. The doomsday message of it's you know it's happening January 23rd. So pack your bags. You can just go through modern history, recent history. How many uh, cultish groups have been at the end of the world? Even wrong, and we still are. Uh, so if Jesus Himself won't even give us the date, just know that is not a group to associate with safely. That's I'll leave it at that. Okay. Any questions about that part? My words are coming out in a scattered way today. I apologize, but I think you get the main idea. Okay. So there's one other thing that I want to mention because uh, it's not a term St. Paul uses, but it is a term in Scripture. The Antichrist, so it's associated with the end of the world. Uh, St. Paul uses man of ill repute or son of destruction or something like that with a capital S like a title. Um, other writers like John, especially, will use the word Antichrist with a capital A. Um, there is one thing clearly associated with the end, and uh, whether this source comes from Judaism or something Jesus taught, I'm not clear on it, but that before the end of the world will come, an Antichrist with a capital A will come, claiming to be God, basically someone posing as Christ coming again, but not him. And through many deceptions and lies, many people in the world will come to believe that he is Christ's return. Um, to explain a little bit of this distinction, because you, you hear this term come up a lot, I would invite you to turn to John's letters. Um, we will say, turn to 1 John. These are the letters in the back of the Bible. Three letters right before, pretty much right before Revelation. First, second, and third John. Uh, look up First John, chapter two, verse eighteen, and we'll read part of chapter four also. Just give a wait until you found the right letter in the spot. Good. Okay. This is one thing John says in his letter. He said, "Children." It is the last hour, and as you have heard, by the way, it is the last hour, and that was 2,000 years ago. Okay? So you can understand the word hour is symbolic in a sense. We, we have been in the end times really since the incarnation. Um, but he says, children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but his letters. They come, they come right before Jude. Okay, give it away when you find it. Got it now? So let me try again. Uh, the subtitle of my Bible says, Warning Against Antichrist. 1 John, not 2 John, not 3 John. There's three letters. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Okay? 
He says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Important point. In my Bible, they're both lowercase a, but he, he's making a distinction between singular Antichrists and plural Antichrists. The word, the word that's actually used here in Greek, Antichrist with the big A is the person. Whoever that is, we believe, I think our church would teach it, Satan himself trying to pose as Jesus come again before the end. Um, but then there are Antichrists, plural. Anybody who claims to be the Christ or anyone who stands in the way of the plans of Christ on some level is an Antichrist. Every generation has Antichrists. There have been hundreds or thousands of them. There, there are many cults we can think of in the past century where the founder of the cult claimed to be Christ. But even in ancient times, in John's times, keep in mind, the Pharaoh of Egypt called himself the Son of God, the Son of Rome. The Emperor of Rome called himself the Son of God because uh, Julius Caesar was declared to be a god, and Augustus Caesar was declared to be divine. And so if you're a descendant of that family, people were claiming divinity. So throughout history, I guess Satan does not have a very imaginative playbook. There have been many people um, who have claimed to be Christ or who have tried to, you know, as a liar, try to get in the way of God's plans. Just know that Antichrist small a is different from the Antichrist, okay? Um, and if you read further from chapter 4 in the same letter, verse 1 through 3, it talks about testing the spirits. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. False prophets would be antichrist with the lowercase a. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit which does not confess Jesus is not of God. This is the spirit of antichrist of which you heard that it was coming. Um, so, essentially I would say the Catholic the Catholic version of understanding of this is less dramatic and exciting than some churches pitch it. We would say, we are in the end times. We have been in the end times for 2,000 years. Uh, there are antichrists all over the place. Uh, and in every age, we you know we have to test the spirits because there are lies. There, there's, if you look at our culture today, look at how many things that are lies that are called the truth, the truth that are called lies. If you have eyes to see, if you're close to God, uh, you can see them. Uh, they're destructive forces, and you know, in every age, it seems like cumulatively it's getting worse. It sort of feels like it, but ultimately, before the final end, there will be someone in the flesh, Antichrist, capital A. And it seems the implication from scriptures that many people will be swayed over to follow that Antichrist. Uh, what is many? I don't know, but. Um, I bring this up because Paul also talks about this son of destruction, or son of ill repute, and the importance of testing spirits. So this is a well-accepted belief within the early Christian movement about the Antichrist and the uh, end. Other parts of this, though, are sort of poetic or symbolic language because they're written in an apocalyptic style. So um, literally, are we going to get sucked up into the sky floating around. I don't think that's the idea. The idea is that God will, you know, God is going to bring judgment. And as St. Paul says, you're suffering now, but your suffering is temporary. Those who t uh, accept the lie and reject God, the, the suffering that they will experience at, at God's judgment will be eternal. And it will be worse. So, so basically, hang tough, stay true, this will all pass, and God will save in the end. That's that's the idea. Questions? Yes. I guess I've never understood why some people are so focused on second coming when, to me, we should always be prepared and ready. Right. 
right here. Well said. Um, you know, Scripture says elsewhere, death will come like a thief in the night. That's my dad's preferred version of that to say, I don't know when the thought end is coming, but my end is coming in my lifetime. <laughs> I'm going to die. The thief's going to come for me, and as far as I'm concerned, I want to be ready for that. Stay vigilant, stay true to the Lord, and in the meantime, he has a lot of work for us to do. You know, in the school of love. So, I agree with you. And even more important, for another reason, uh, talk about the end of the world stuff tends to be terrifying to people. It kind of frightens them. I don't think God wants us to convert out of fear. He wants us to follow him out of love. And he doesn't want us to live in fear. He said, peace be with you. My peace I give you. You know, be not afraid. I go before you always. So, the consistent message of scripture is don't live in fear. Don't freak out. Be at, be at peace. We'll, you know, as long as we are the right team and Christ is in our boat or we're in his boat, however you want to think of it, we're doing what we need to do. So. I do know that there's a verse where it's relating to that where it says that even the elect could be fooled by this antichrist. So I don't remember, but I think there's more to that verse. So what is it that we need to get out of that verse? Well, the way I will say, I know, I know the passage here you speak of, um, but to be fooled is different from to be ultimately fooled in the end. Because the way the word elect is used in scripture is ultimately those who are in heaven at the end of all this. Those souls in heaven are the elect. So even if temporarily fooled, you come around to understand uh, um, and recognize God. And to just say, as Jesus advises, by their fruit you will know them. So when claims are made of things, watch closely and notice what kind of fruit is being born. You know, you see signs of pride, disobedience, you cannot be of God. Um, eventually, you know, the father of lies is good at camouflaging himself for a time, but he can't do it long term. Eventually, evil shows its face. So, um, I think the best advice is in, in our life of prayer, we learn to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd, um, the Holy Spirit guiding us and growing within us. I think will guide us in those critical moments to, to understand the right place to be standing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because even, even now in our humanness, we can see people that are so easily fooled yeah. by liars. Sure. Well, if you, when you put it that way, exhibit A, okay, <laughs> I think actually none of us can say we're an exception. If we've given into sin at any time in our life, we've given into a lie. Every sin, every temptation of sin is a lie. It's a shiny red apple. Um, and we, we've taken something that God made that was good and we're using it in a disorder or evil way because we've been, a lie's been presented to us and we've accepted it least in those moments, but uh, the goal is uh, to get the final, the final question right, as, uh, as one of our teachers likes to say, if, if there is a pop quiz to get into heaven, there isn't, but if there were one, the answer is love, we just know that, <laughs> and, and behave accordingly, so, okay, I just want you to be aware, and okay, sorry. What is the term testing the spirits? One of them is just where I read in John, first letter of John, um, and it appears also in this first letter of Paul in the, in the closing line. We'll come to it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's just pick up from there. Okay. So anyway, I hope you at least get a hint. One day, one day we'll do a Bible study in the book of Revelation. It's not often enough preached in the Catholic churches, I think. Um, some churches, it's the most popular book to preach about. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't tend to focus as much on it, but I think, um, you know, when you take the sensationalism out of it, the, the pathway Christ calls us to is really actually fairly simple. Love God, love neighbor, um, you know, and be guided by that. Love fulfills all of God's law. So you don't have to have a genius. 
this IQ to get to heaven, thankfully. The, the smallest child can understand. It's just living in this art, aren't it? Uh, so we pick up on chapter 5. Okay? Oh, and the last thing, I said it last time, but the other thing tied to this, which is very polar opposite of the idea of good people being spared suffering, is, first of all, the entire message of Scripture. I said it last time. Uh, how many good people in Scripture have suffered? Even God's chosen people, the Jewish people, suffered greatly. Uh, great patriarchs and prophets suffered greatly. Their message was rejected. The, the going into modern Christianity, martyrs of every generation of every century suffered. So there's nothing in, in the whole history of faith that would suggest that good people are spared from suffering. We call it the mystery of the cross. Um, and sometimes God teaches us the most powerful lessons through suffering. Um, but for that reason, it doesn't, it's not in harmony with our understanding of faith in general. But add to it Paul's words where he says, in my own body I make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Christ is suffering, it's perfect. So what could be lacking in the suffering of Christ? We would say nothing except that he's Christ the head, we are the body of Christ. And it is fitting, when we're called to be Christ-like, to live like Christ, that we can expect to suffer. And Jesus says as much, he said, the world will hate you because it first hated me. Um, he never gives us a suggestion that it will be anything other than that. You'll be rejected, just as I'm rejected. Um, so we, we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And that, that cross in part is the sufferings of the the life we live. Okay, so from chapter 5, we'll just pick up from there. But as to the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a woman with child. And there will be no escape but you are not in darkness, brethren. For that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. And put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That's kind of an early hint of what you'll get to see in Ephesians, putting on the armor of God. There's a kind of a, a light version of it there. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we wake or sleep, we might live with Him. Therefore, encourage one another. And build one another up, just as you're doing. I think embedded in that last bit of passage, and again, it kind of touches on what I said. God does not want us to live in fear. It's words of encouragement. That God didn't create you for wrath. He created you to be saved. He desires all of us to be saved, but he doesn't tread on free will. You've got to accept it. Yeah, he's holding it out for all of us, um, but it's... It's the task in this life for us to reach out and accept the gift. Um, and live in the light, walk in the light. Uh, final exhortation from verse 12 says, But we beg you, brethren, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we exhort you, brethren, to admonish the idol. Again, this is the comment toward the idol. Uh, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that none of you repay evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophesying, but test everything. To your question, that's one of the appearances of testing. Test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. 
May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjure you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So, basically a message of encouragement with a, a light touch on the end of the world. <laughs> in the middle. That, that's First Thessalonians if you have to catalog it in your brain. Second Thessalonians, we would argue, is kind of a clarification of this. And it touches a little bit more on um, the end of things. Yes. Today I'm reading the New American Bible, and instead of the word idle, it used unruly. Those are very different words. Yeah, they are. Um, I hate to say this because we use the New American Bible as the preferred translation for our Mass. This is according to the decision of the U.S. bishops. It's not the universal translation used in the English-speaking world. But do you want to know the number one argument why they chose that? They say the New American Bible is translated uh, appropriately to an eighth grade reading level. Uh, if you go to Canada, they use the uh, Revised Standard Version. If you go to England, it's still others. So just know Unfortunately, this is why I keep like 20 different Bible translations in my office. It's good to cross-check a little bit, but that's unfortunate. That would, I, I'd like to know what the original Greek word in that was, but that seems kind of sloppy. That two words are so very different. Could be the result. Sometimes the reason is, uh, I guess, it's a great frustration. I, I wish I were a better linguist, but I, I have studied Greek, and I, I know enough Greek to know that, for instance, Sometimes you'll find a Greek word that's so amazing. It might have like four meanings. And John, this amazing wordsmith, he chooses this and he intends all four meanings. It's just a, a multi-layered wedding cake. But we don't have an English word with four meanings. So unless you want to translate it as a paragraph, the kind of rule of the translators has been choose the primary meaning. But then you have to make a decision. What was the primary meaning? You know, it's, it's, it gets hazardous. It's, it's tough. Um, that's why, by the way, we have the Latin Vulgate. Uh, St. Jerome wrote this because Latin is a dead language. Uh, no longer used. So the words don't continue to morph with each generation. Just in my own lifetime, certain words have changed meaning three or four times. Uh, Latin doesn't do that. So uh, a good cross-check if, is if you knew Latin. Um, Archbishop Glassman wanted me to get a licentious inscription, but the, the big stopper was I would have had to become fluent in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And I'm, I'm not good enough at language to handle that. Um, so God didn't even dare to kind of mind for that. It wasn't my destiny. But when you hear it explained by an exceptional scholar, it's kind of mind blowing. Father, when they talk about testing the spirits, they also say, you know, do not. Um, despise prophetic utterances. Right. And um, <clears throat> and so. So, like, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because he says in Corinthians, which we'll get to in January, that's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to, to, to be able to prophesy. But, but along those lines, when there are those in the church that are um, leading others to understand church teachings differently, um, how are people to discern when we are asked to place our faith in our bishops and such? Well, two comments I would make. It's, it's a challenging thing, but two comments. First of all, the magisterium is the Pope and the bishops in union with them. And by the way, the Pope also has to be in union with previous popes. So Pope Francis couldn't wake up today and say, huh, God just revealed to me there's a quadrinity. And John's going to need to tell you about the fourth person. That's not, that would not be a union with 2,000 years of history. But the magisterium consists of that. If there's a bishop in isolation of everybody else um, <coughs> who's teaching something erroneous, the magisterium will point that out. Um, we can delve 
delve deeper into doctrine, but new doctrine is not possible. Uh, we call it the deposit of faith. So Jesus gave us the full package. We're still unwrapping it so we can increase our depth of understanding or we can apply these ancient teachings to modern problems. But new teachings are not coming forward. So two things I would say. First of all, when it comes to texts that you would read, look for uh, imprimatur and Neil Abstab. You know, in Catholic books, Neil Abstab means uh, no error, you know, free, free of error. Uh, and imprimatur is safe to read, basically. It's, it's been reviewed by a bishop. So when you see that stamp of approval, it's gone through the step of being looked at and edited that you know you're concerned. Secondly, where this would most commonly happen is in mystical claims, you know, supernatural stuff, apparitions or whatever. Um, those all fall into the category of what we call private revelation. No Catholic is required to believe private revelation. And if you believe in it, you're not you shouldn't be pressuring someone else to believe it if they don't want to. Um, but even before you do that, the church investigates. They, they take on the job of testing the spirits. Um, one of the rules is that some proclaimed event has to have ceased. If it's still ongoing, they will not pronounce anything because the nature of it might change. So they interview everyone involved. They send investigators to, to the site or whatever. Um, so I trust the magisterium. That's, that's the biggest safeguard right there, and we believe it's guided by the Holy Spirit. So... That, uh, you know, Jesus, when he appointed Peter to be the head of the twelve, we, as Catholics, we interpret that as the first one. Um, you're, you are rock, and I'm this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Um, which means that at the end of time, when the end of time comes, the church will be there somewhere. There's no promise, note, there's no promise that the church will be in the United States. There's no promise that the United States will be there, let alone the church will be there. So it's not a promise of, of that the church will be present, you know, in every nation and every place on earth, but the church will be there in some form. Uh, past that, I can't say, but I trust that uh, God desires our salvation and that he's, he's given us protections to guide us. So let's let's shift to Second Thessalonians. It's just three short chapters. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians, in God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and the peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a brief business slide reading. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren. As is fitting, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions. So there it is again, about the second paragraph, mentioning again that this ongoing persecution is still happening. And in the afflictions which you are enduring. So persecutions and afflictions. But this is one of those rare examples of a church that's doing amazingly well. You can compare it a little bit to John, you know, opens up the book of Revelations, a letter addressed to the seven churches. Some of the churches are scolded quite heavily because of their loss of faith. But one or two of the churches that have suffered greatly in persecution, he just, he just compliments them on their faithfulness. Thess Thessalonica is one of those places that the people are doing amazingly well and even growing in love and growing in faith. Um, and it goes on to say, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be made worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Since indeed God deems it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant rest for us to you who are afflicted uh, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance upon those who do not know God and upon those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Uh, here again is the framework. The good are suffering, 
but your suffering will come to an end. Those who are getting away with being seemingly, your suffering is about to begin with the wrath of God. So the second coming is being framed as a wrathful arrival of God's justice. They shall suffer the punishment of eternal destruction and exclusion from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his call and may fulfill every good resolve and work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. chapter. The one thing I just would like to add, because I don't want anyone to get a distorted, unhealthy image of God. You might read that at a certain way and think, God's in a bad mood. <laughs> like he's very fickle. And what if the timing's bad? You know, what if I'm having a bad week? That's not fair. I was mostly good, but you came on a week and I'm having a rough week. Uh, that's, that would be a really twisted image of God, because our catechism teaches, first of all, it is God's desire that all be saved. He created us for life. Um, that's why, that's really the nature of suffering. I heard, I heard one priest describe it as like a whitewater river because he liked, he likes uh, whitewater rapids. And he said, you know, imagine God's love is like the rapids. If you're in harmony with God's love, it's a beautiful ride. Well, let's, you see an aluminum canoe or a raft that wrapped up on the rocks and watch the river crush it. He said, that is the experience of God's love to someone who hates God. God's love doesn't stop, but to one who hates God, who wants God out of their life, that's the source of suffering, in part. Um, so, I don't want anyone to read in this that someone was born for destruction, that someone was born to go to hell, that God created them to fail and to go to hell. There, there is, in the, in the roots of Calvinism, there is this kind of sense that some of us lucky folk are predestined for heaven and some are predestined for hell. That he had a different understanding of the definition of predestiny. We use that word predestiny as Catholics, but not in that sense. Uh, we... We believe God desires heaven for everyone. But God lives in eternity also. He is omniscient. He knows how the story will end. He knows whose name is already in the book of life. And we know that everyone has received abundant enough grace for salvation. Multiple opportunities. Multiple opportunities. For the one who's stubborn and hard-hearted who just rejects God and goes, goes to the grave thinking, stay away from me. God essentially honors that request, but it's not a good thing to ask for. And it's not from God's heart. He just respects our free will. And it, it must be so, because in order for love to exist, we need free will. So free will opens up the possibility that someone will say no, as sad as that is. Okay? Um, so pick it up from, from two. The man of lawlessness. This is the Antichrist, is why I took the time to turn to John's letter. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembly to meet him, we beg you, brethren, not to be quickly shaken in mind or excited, either in spirit or in word. Good rule of thumb right there before you even get into what he's saying next. Don't be excited or shaken. Don't be a person who's quickly pulled by wild claims of things. Be a calm, discerning person. Be a person with peace in your heart. Be a, a, a person of discernment. Uh, and especially don't live by fear. Um, either by spirit or by word or by letter, reporting to me from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Here's the, the thing that I touched on very briefly that apparently there's been some false letter uh, that somebody is claiming, St. Paul wrote it, you know, they're forging his signature. So he briefly addresses here a letter purporting to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. 
Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of all this, this is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by his appearing and his coming. The coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with pretended signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are to perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends upon them a strong delusion to make them believe what is false so that all may be condemned who do not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So the arrival of the Antichrist will be accompanied by deceptive signs and wonders. This person will be able to do supernatural things. And because of that, some people will believe it's Christ come again. But it will be a false, a false person. And there, by this group, he will be revealed too. You sure? Well, there, am I misunderstanding where he says, therefore God is sending them a deceiving power? Well, here's a language problem. It's very similar to when, like for instance, think of Moses and the Pharaoh, when it says God will make them obstinate. When you hear that kind of language, it's problematic, I, I acknowledge. But uh, we will say, what's the best way to explain this? We speak of God's will in two ways God's ordaining will and God's permissive will. Okay? That's where dating will is things that must happen according to his plan. For instance, that the Son of God will become incarnate, that he will come and pay the price for our sins. That is a must happen. Um, his permissive will is not treading on our free will. You know, if I, I can do something that could offend God, the way he could stop it is strike me dead. But if I keep on living and I do something terrible, that's God's permissive to it. God didn't do it, but he steps back and lets it unfold. So I think it's, the language is pertaining to that, that uh, God's going to allow this testing to happen by, by not stopping it, not by direct causation. Does that help? Okay. Uh, it was well said. I think Sally is the one who said it. Well said, God writes straight with crooked lines, and she said one day, crooked lines is our sin. Yes, God's permissive will. He lets us go and see and he to us. And we sin and we make a mess. But when he's writing straight, that's his ordaining will. So he can bring about what he needs to bring about despite all of our bad decisions and our immorality. That's one measure of his power. I know it's confusing, so it's, it's challenging, but um, so picking up from verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you from the beginning to be saved through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ so then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. Here's, I feel inspired to say at this point, again, what I said in the very first class, when we read from Peter's letter, uh, an advisement about Paul's writing, that many people have made a shipwreck of their faith. 
that his writing is very easy to misunderstand. These are examples of it. His writing style is rather unclear. But here's an example. When it says God chose you from the beginning, a misinterpretation could be God chose you from the beginning, but God didn't chose you from the beginning. Sorry. You have to go to hell. You get to go to heaven. It's not that. But John Calvin misinterpreted that. Uh, the idea of predestiny in that sense. Um, what he could have said is, God chose all of us for sanctification. It's not everyone received the gift. So it is true that you were chosen from eternity. But everyone was chosen from eternity. And some just rejected it. Well, verse 16, it says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. I like that. It's kind of back to calmness. Hope and grace. And keep doing what you're doing. Just try to live a good life. That's a good calm message right at the end of that. Any other questions about chapter 2? Okay. Chapter 3 is also very brief, but we'll, we'll finish it. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed on and triumph as it did among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things which we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. There's the example of the, the virtue of hope. What he really says, you're, you're off to a good start, but we hope you'll keep on it. And in the meantime, we're intertwined by prayer. You pray for us in the missionary field, we'll pray for you. Keep on doing good work. Uh, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness. Here's again, it's about the fourth or fifth mention of idleness. And why we feel this was such a problem in Thessalonica. Uh, and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We did not eat anyone's bread without pay. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not burden any of you. It was not because we have not the right, but to give you in our conduct an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command, if anyone will not work, let him not eat. For we hear that some of you are working in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work in quietness and to earn their own living. Brethren, do not be weary in well-doing. So, that gives you a, this is embedded in your Catholic social teaching of uh, we have we have a welfare system and if it's used properly it's good there are people with disabilities there are people for health reasons or other complicated reasons they cannot work they're not employable maybe. and it's it's right in a, in a moral society to look after those people who are not able to look after themselves but essentially the message is if you are able to look after yourself. It's immoral not to. We, for the last two years or so, when, when the Feast of St. Joseph has come up, St. Joseph the Worker, we get a subscription prayers, and it says, for the unemployed and the underemployed, uh, that they might find dignified work. I really want to change that. In our, our current situation, I don't think it's applying. We have close to 10 million people in America who are employed and who choose not to be employed. They are, they are taking advantage of governmental systems. That's immoral. And it's just one of many examples that, you know, our founding fathers in America said that this governmental system is based on Judeo-Christian values. If we ever reach a point in which our nation no longer supports Judeo-Christian values, the governmental system will fall. It won't, it won't be able to stand. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not a workable system that much dead weight. And 
anybody who's able should, should bear their own share of the burden. And at the same time, we have seen it's a good law, and we help people do it. We let God serve that out. But as for you and I, you know, we have to ask ourselves, am I, am I being active and am I contributing to society? Is this is part of our moral responsibility as Christian disciples. Um, if anyone refuses to obey what we say in this letter, note that man and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not look at him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Two beautiful things about this passage I like. This is from verse 14. First of all, one not so beautiful, but it's historical reality. So in the early Christian community, when Christians were still quite a minority, you know, they had very much this idea, as Scripture said, if you see someone in error, correct them. If they don't respond, bring, bring a friend, you know, try again. If they don't respond, bring the weight of the church. And after that, if they don't respond, have nothing to do with them. It's a kind of a shunning system. We might today call it being out of communion. You know, you're excommunicated because a person... If a person is that stubborn, I don't know why they would want to hang out with people of faith anyway, um, if their heart is that hardened. But the idea of excommunication in the church comes from that idea, to say, uh, we're actually not being cruel in this, we're, we're trying to get your attention. And if you have rejected everybody's efforts, our disassociation with you should shout at you, it should speak loudly. You're in the wrong, you need to repent or you need to be reconciled, you need to do something to change your life, otherwise you can't have a place with us. Uh, the the busybody type of person who's not contributing, and as I, sh I share, this is recorded in early Christian history, known people who went around fraudulently preying on Christians' goodwill, just being a, being a couch potato and showing up in a community and collecting until they got tired of you. This is Eventually, his wisdom is to say, you need to invite them to leave at a certain point uh, because they're, they're a toxic presence in your community. Um, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, in all ways, and the Lord be with you. Oh, the second, the second line that I wanted to say, though. Do not look on him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Um, Father John... He said something wonderful at the end of the pastoral assembly. He just looked around at everyone in the room and said, um, he, was, he was commenting about how sometimes our political views or our other values, we let them take priority over the gospel, and we let the divisions of the world enter our church unnecessarily. And he said, I want everybody to understand clearly, uh, your enemy is not other people. There is no other human being who is your enemy. We have to, all of us need to work on this. Trying to love people who maybe have very different views from us. He said, you have one enemy, it's Satan. Satan is the one who twists the hearts of people. Other people are not your enemy. There are people that God calls us to love. And if they're temporarily acting like your enemy, we're supposed to pray for our enemy. But um, it's a good reminder, and St. Paul says the same thing here. Even the knuckleheads, they're not really your enemy. The enemy is the Antichrist. Um, I, Paul, write this screen with my own hand. This is the mark in every letter of mine. This, this goes back to the forged letter. <laughs> he highlights, remembering Galatians, I write with big, a big writing style. And here he says, take note of my signature. I write it the same way in every letter. And in the future, if I send you another letter, if my signature doesn't look like this, it's not me. He's what he's kind of saying at the end, a cautionary thing. Um, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. So there it is. Um, overall takeaway for me, never never get excited or distracted about fellow Christians who report to know when the end of the world is coming. It's nonsense. And it cannot be of God, just by definition. But they're claiming to know time. It's, it's distraction. Um, our task is to Keep living the faith, loving one another, following the path faithfully, staying vigilant, uh, discerning, and testing the spirits. That's it. So, 
it's a good philosophy for how to face facing the sin of tunes. Any last comments about that song? All right. I'll stick around if people have questions. For those who follow this online, thank you for joining us. Uh, it'll be first Corinthians, I believe. Someone has a reading schedule. Because Paul wrote this letter, if you recall, from Corinth. And so the next thing he's going to write when he leaves Corinth, almost two years later, he'll be writing to the Corinthians. That is the problem. Uh, I've heard a lot of preachers say, I would like to call this letter, the letter St. Paul to the Californians. <laughs> but you might say America in general. You might see a lot of ourselves in that seems like it's speaking to our times here in the United States. Um, so yeah, check that out over the Christmas break, first and second Corinthians. That's what we'll go to next. We'll start on the first Wednesday of January. So we'll see you then. Uh, until then, make a space in your heart for the Christ child. Have a very Merry Christmas. Uh, and we just pray glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be.